Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hicks, I want to talk a little about uh, what FEMA's role is in terms of resilience. And uh, I, I noted that as head of the North Carolina Department of Public Safety, you've had a lot of experience with uh, natural disasters. I mentioned earlier that we've recently passed this uh, legislation that was signed into law this week that provides another $1 billion in funding for, for BRIC, the Building Resilient Infrastructure Communities Program. Uh, basically, pre-disaster mitigation to ensure that the taxpayer money is better spent by mitigating uh, some of these potential disasters and, and helping potential victims avoid uh, the devastation of a, of a hurricane, as you've had in, in your state, uh, or a tornado or other uh, floods or, or fires and so on. Um, have you worked with BRIC? Do you have any experience with them? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Portman. Thank you for the question. Uh, through our uh, very experienced emergency management team in North Carolina, uh, North Carolina has pretty successfully navigated the early rollout of the BRIC program. Uh, it is my view that with sustainable funding, the BRIC program can be really transformative uh, to uh, the states and consequently uh, to the nation. Uh, BRIC program focuses on a very necessary tool uh, that we should be utilizing more, and that is mitigation. I think it's well accepted that the investment of every $1 in mitigation can save us $6 on the back end. And so we have uh, stood up a robust uh, uh, protocol to address the BRIC funding in North Carolina uh, that not only operates at the state level, but really partners with FEMA, our FIT team that uh, was the first in the nation in North Carolina has been instrumental uh, to our success and also the build out of the Office of Recovery and Resiliency to work with our local communities to help build a more resilient North Carolina and ultimately a more resilient nation. Good. Well, I, again, conceptually, it's a great idea, a uh, relatively new program, as, as you know, and uh, since 2020, about one and a half billion dollars has gone out, so it, it's, it's out there and I'm glad you're working with it. I hope, uh, should you be confirmed, that you'll work with us to even improve the program further, and probably some lessons from North Carolina would be helpful in that. Um, would you commit to do that? Yes, sir, Ranking Member Portman. I certainly commit to work with you and your staff, as well as FEMA uh, leadership, to address any challenges and to break down any barriers that we have mm -hmm. to be successful. This committee has spent a lot of time on helping to push back against the hateful attacks on uh, religious organizations, other nonprofits. Uh, we have this program that we've put together called the Nonprofit Security Grant Program. And uh, we've made preparedness grants there available uh, over the last several years. This year, we actually doubled the funding to 180 million bucks, split even between the urban areas and the states. Uh, are you aware of this program? Have you used it in North Carolina? Yes, sir. Again, thank you for the question, uh, Ranking Member Portman. As the state administrative agent, as well as the Homeland Security Advisor, uh, I had sign-off authority on the development of those uh, grants as far as the administration in the state of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, we were successful in North Carolina at bringing uh, not just the emergency management entity, which the money would flow through from FEMA, but bringing law enforcement and intelligence resources uh, in, uh, in partnership with those communities so that we could adequately protect faith-based institutions uh, through this process. And again, we have navigated that program pretty successfully in North Carolina. Well, as you, as you may know, some states have used it more effectively than others. Uh, North Carolina has been pretty aggressive in using it. Uh, it sounds like my state of Ohio has certainly been successful in figuring out ways to put it to work. So uh, we are glad you support it. Uh, and, and we look forward to working with you on ensuring that the funding we're providing is, is spent most effectively. Uh, with regard to uh, the controller position, Ms. Blas uh, Blashford, we talked about this in person, so you, you know where I'm coming from. Um, you have a great deal of expertise and experience in the housing sector, as an example, uh, but you're not up for uh, HUD secretary. Um, you're up for another job, which, again, is one that is just a hardcore financial management, auditing, uh, accounting job. Um, I, I mentioned earlier the U.S. Code and what it requires this job to have and, you know, demonstrated ability and practical experience in accounting, financial management, and financial systems, extensive practical experience in financial management in large governmental or business entities. Uh, I know you don't have a CPA, but regarding accounting, do you have any practical experience uh, as this calls for or ability in accounting? Um, thank you very much for that question, Ranking Member Portman, and thank you for the conversation yesterday. I'm glad to continue that conversation today. 
Um, I don't have uh, a training in accounting, but I would just uh, pull back a bit to say a couple of things about why I do think that I'm qualified for this role. Um, first, as an experienced nonprofit and government leader of large teams, I have, by definition and by necessity, deeply involved myself in financial management. Everything from budget development and execution, financial management of systems, enterprise risk management, auditing, and so just have learned to the point that you made about practical experience, have learned um, that I can deeply engage myself in those details as needed. Um, but I also learn, have learned to rely on the expertise of those around me. I think most leaders know that you don't have every technical skill in your, tool, in your toolkit, but, but often you can rely on your team for the areas that you might not have or that you need to complement. And everything I've heard about the OMB and OFFM teams is that they're extraordinary and would be supportive in that particular area. I would also say, I think this is a question about what we need as a country right now, and I think from my perspective, I would bring the strategic vision and the ability to support and work with the technical experts on my team, but really drawing on the expertise and the experience I've had of navigating the inputs from accounting, the inputs from financial management to make the right decisions for the organization that I'm working for. So look forward to, if confirmed, working with you to make sure that we're really addressing all of those concerns. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I just have a hard time squaring what the requirements are, and again, having known that, that, that position, and it's true that as a leader you rely on others, but the reason the statute was written that way and, and knowing the job, uh, having the expertise and experience is really important uh, for the leader. Um, I'm not surprising here because I talked about this on, on the phone, but can you explain the Federal Credit Reform Act and how you see this impacting how various federal credit programs calculate their leverage? So it's my understanding that the Federal Credit Reform Act is a set of decisions in terms of current and proposed programs. That evaluation is made by the Budget Review Division with an OMB that sits outside of OFFM. But I, I, as we discussed yesterday, I understand where you're coming from on this larger question and had some experience working on this when I was at HUD with the FHA balance sheet. So we we'll look forward, if confirmed, to working with you the BRD team, and others at OMB to address any concerns you might have about current or future programs as it relates to that uh, Reform Act. Thank you. My time's expired. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You.